much do you know about your financial situation? I'm talking about like the details, the, the hard numbers. Ignorance can be very expensive. So today we're talking about the questions that you should be asking about your money so that you can keep more of it in your pocket. If you're new, let me introduce myself. I'm Adelia Borchade, also known as Picky Girl Travels the World. Um, I help black women master their money so they can live life on their terms. If the life you love involves some kind of tr long-term travel, moving abroad, make sure you grab a copy of my Ultimate Move Abroad checklist. There is a link to the checklist below in the description and there's a link right here. First thing, we have to remember that the financial services industry is in business to make money. They're not helping you out of the kindness of their heart. They're trying to line their pockets. It is to their benefit for you not to really understand what they are charging you, how they're charging you, where the fees are. You really have to be proactive and ask questions. Go grab pen and some paper and I'm going to tell you what are those questions you should be asking about your money. We're going to start with credit cards. First thing you need to ask about your credit card, what is the interest rate you're paying? Is it fixed or is it variable? That means are you paying the same interest rate every, every month or does it go up and down depending on market rate? Are you paying an annual fee? for this card. This is a fee you pay the credit card company for the privilege of being able to use their credit card. Personally, I don't believe in paying annual fees, but I know a lot of people get lots of travel perks and different kinds of perks from their cards that have a fee. So what you need to do is figure out the value of the perks you're getting. Does it outweigh the cost of the annual fee that you're paying? There are plenty of cards that do not have annual fees that do include some perks if that's something that's important to you. How much will they charge you if you have a late payment? Are there consequences to making late payments? So for instance, there are some cards that yes, do charge you a fee because your payment was late, but there is also the additional consequence of they jack up your interest rate. So you're getting hit twice for one mistake. When is a payment considered late? Do you need to make a payment by 5 p.m. on the due date? Is it 8 p.m.? Do you get to midnight? Do not assume that you have up until midnight on the payment date to make a payment because that is not always true. So that's something you need to ask. How are they calculating interest? There are some cards that calculate interest on your daily balance. Some calculate on the end. You need to understand how your card is calculating interest. Also, let's say you make a late payment. Your payment is one day late. You, you pay what is due. Are they still going to charge you interest for the 24 hours that you carried that balance? That's something you need to ask about. When it comes to loans, personal loans, mortgage loans, uh, student loans, uh, furniture loans, I don't know but just loans in general. Some of the things you need to ask are these. Again, what is the interest rate? Is it fixed? Is it variable? How are they calculating interest? What is the repayment term for this loan? Like how long do you have to pay this loan back? So I see this mistake made a lot when people go to buy cars, they get very focused on the monthly payment and they go in and they this is a huge mistake they tell the dealer um i want my payment to be under 500 dollars a month well what you've just done is given them license to screw you over they could be giving you a 72 month loan but it's keeping your payments where you need where you said you wanted them to be so you need to understand how long is this loan for. Can you pay it off early? Is that allowed? And is there a prepayment penalty? Um, this is common uh, with mortgages quite a few times and other loans, depending how they're structured. But you know, 
if you've watched any video on this channel, you know how I feel about debt and I want you to eliminate it as soon as possible, especially personal or unsecured debt. Uh, so paying it off before the term would be to your advantage. And that's why some uh, companies penalize you for doing that. Is there a penalty for making late payments? What is it? Uh, is there a grace period with mortgage loans? Those are probably the only loans that I know of that. Yeah, your payment may be due on the first, but technically you have until the 15th to pay it until before they start uh, hitting you with fines or, you know, fees or whatever. So questions to ask. There are questions you should be asking about your bank accounts. It does not matter if you have an online only bank, if you have a credit union, you have one of the big brick and mortar banks. It doesn't matter. They are in the business of making money and you need to understand how are they making money off of you. So things you should ask include, is there a service charge? Is there a charge that they have like, they may call it something else. Typically it is called a service charge and it is a monthly fee you pay for the privilege of having your account there. Y'all already know, I don't believe in paying for that privilege. Overdraft fees. How much are they going to charge you if by chance your balance isn't sufficient to meet all of the items coming in? Is there overdraft protection? Is there a cost for overdraft protection? Some banks will, like if you have a checking and a savings, they will automatically transfer money over so that you, you the overdrafts can go through. Are they going to charge you for that? If so, how much? That's something to be careful of because a lot of savings accounts typically have a limit to the number of transactions they can have. So you might think, well, my bank is so kind, they will transfer money over from my savings account to my checking account to cover any shortages. But if your savings account is limited to six transactions a month, you happen to have four or five, uh, things come through, are they making four or five separate uh, transfers? Because what they're doing is setting you up so that if you make one or two more, you then go over and then they can penalize you on that. So you need to ask clear questions. How do they process incoming debits to your account? So when you use your debit card or I don't know, does anybody write checks anymore? Uh, when those things come back to the bank to be paid, how do they process them? Are they processing them in the order that they come in? A lot of banks, and I, I, I used to work at a bank, I know people who work at a bank, a lot of banks look at what's in your account and sometimes instead of processing payments as they come in in order, they will choose the largest one in an effort to get you to have insufficient funds so they can hit you with a, um, with a, with a fee, an NSF fee. So you need to understand how are they, don't assume that, oh, I, I pay for this thing on Monday, this thing on Tuesday. I have, I'll be able to beat the thing on Tuesday because they may decide to process the thing on Tuesday first, if it's to their advantage. Does the bank charge for statements, paper statements? Do they charge for online statements? If so, how much? Don't assume those are free. How much are they going to charge you if you use another bank's ATM? I've already talked to y'all about getting a Schwab money management account or a Fidelity money management account so you can avoid that and you can avoid it when you are abroad. Is there a minimum balance required? Is there a certain amount of money you are required to keep into that account or they will charge you a fee? Find out what that minimum is. Find out what the, what the fee is. Again, I don't believe in paying for those, but you may love this bank, so you don't want to move your account, but you do need to understand how they're making money off of you. Uh, I mentioned savings accounts often have maximum number of transactions, but it is not unusual for that to be true of checking accounts as well. So that's some, especially, uh, usually it might be a trade-off, like they'll give you a free checking account, but you are limited to the number of transactions you can have. 
So that's something you definitely want to ask about. What about your investing accounts? What about your retirement accounts? I'm talking about your 401k or your 403b at work. I'm talking about your IRAs, whether they are traditional or Roth. I'm talking about your brokerage account. Not asking the proper questions or not understanding how they're charging you could make hundreds of thousands of dollars difference in how much money you have to retire with. And it doesn't matter if these accounts are the ones you personally manage or the ones that are through your job. You need to understand how they're charging you. Do they charge a custodial fee? And if so, how much? And is it per account? Is it per type of account? Uh, is there a time when after you have a certain amount in assets, they will do away with that charge or lessen it? This is a place that I see people get burned when they leave an employer and they leave a 401k with that employer because they're like, you know, the investments I have in there are fine. I'm not worried about it. But what they don't realize is that as an employee, the employer is taking care of some fees for you. But when you no longer work there, even though your money is still there, they're going to start passing those fees on to you. So you need to understand what you're paying. If you do a trade, you purchase new uh, investments, be they stocks, be they mutual funds, be they ETFs, how much are you being charged for a trade? I don't have to tell you, I don't believe in paying for that. Once upon a time, getting a trade for like $5.99 was a big deal. It is too easy to trade for zero dollars to be paying any kind of money. And some places pay more than that. It really depends on what kind of brokerage, who you're working with. Is there a fee for advising? I know that a lot of people are not confident in their ability to manage their own assets and they would like to defer uh, to the knowledge of a financial planner or a financial advisor. How much are you, how much are you paying for that? How are they charging you? Typically, if you have an account with a brokerage firm, they are going to charge you a percentage of the assets under management. For example, if you have a portfolio of less than $500,000, they're probably going to charge you somewhere around 2% of the amount of money you have under management. And typically, as your portfolio increases in size, uh, the amount they charge you goes down. So like if you've got uh, more than 500,000, it typically is around 1%. And I know you're thinking 2%, that's not that much. Yes, it is. If you think it about you're investing for the long haul and you're paying somebody 2% every year for 40 years, for 30 years, and your portfolio is growing in size, because that's after all what you're paying them to do, we could be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions. So I want you to understand what you're paying for versus what you're getting. One way, if, if you really feel you need somebody to help and to manage things for you, you don't trust yourself, um, you can get a robo advisor and typically they charge, somebody like Betterment charges 0.25%, which is significantly better than three, two or three percent. So, you know, uh, but you do need to understand if you have an account with somebody like Fidelity, they are not, they'll be like, oh, you can call and ask for help. Don't assume that help is free. Make sure you ask if that's, because if, if you're not doing the buying and selling and the choosing yourself, if somebody at the company is helping you do that, that is considered advising. And you need, before you have them do a single thing, ask for clarity about how are they being compensated? How are you gonna be charged? Continuing when we're talking about investments, we also need to ask questions about the cost of the funds. Remember, nobody is in this game for free, okay? So as you are buying investments, you're, you're, when you buy individual stocks, there's the stock price. But when you buy mutual funds, when you buy ETFs, the, the, the prices that you are paying for, um, 
the services involved, like the, ma the management, the, the stock picking, all of that, isn't always, it's not upfront in bold. You have to go look for it. So some of the things that you need to look for are expense ratio. The expense ratio is the annual fee for investment management and operating expenses, um, the expertise, this is the money you're paying for the expertise of the manager. It's calculated as a percentage of the assets that you have. This cost is deducted from your return. So what that means is you buy a mutual fund, the average expense ratio on a mutual fund is 0.52%. But I have seen mutual funds with expense ratios as much as 4%. So that means every year, no matter how much money you make or lose, you they are going to take their 4% off the top. Now, to give you sort of a frame of reference, rev, uh, to give you sort of a frame of reference, I've seen some as high as 4%. This includes in employee plans. Don't assume because the plan is from your employer that the expense ratio is low. Do not assume that. Uh, the average is 0.52%, but uh, VTI, the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index ETF, the expense ratio is 0.04, okay? So I don't know about y'all, but I would much rather have to pay somebody 0.04% than 4% of my money, okay? So expense ratio is one thing you gotta look at. The other thing, this is typically with mutual funds, are loads. A load is a fee. Why do they call it a load and not a fee? I don't know, maybe to confuse us. But um, many mutual funds have front end loads where they charge you a fee up front for the privilege of buying it. Some have back end loads. They charge you a fee when you sell it. Okay, so you need to ask, if it, it, are there any loads? If so, what are they? Um, so how does this impact you? So let's say you've got $10,000 to invest in a fund that has an 8.5% front end load. That means you're not actually investing $10,000 in that fund. You're only investing $9,150 because they're getting their 8.5% right off the top. Sometimes a fund will be advertised as, you know, like, oh, it doesn't cost you any money to get in, but it may cost you money to get out. So see if there is a surrender fee, a back-end load. Back-end loads tend to start around 5%. So as I'm throwing these numbers around, just realize that paying those fees is money that doesn't get to go into your pocket. That's money that doesn't get to stay in the market and grow uh, for you. And so you, you, I'm hoping you see why these are such important questions to ask. As you're asking these questions, if you cannot get satisfactory answers, you need to be doing business with someone else, plain and simple. Anybody who makes you feel bad about asking questions is not somebody you should be doing business with. As my mama always used to say, your money is green everywhere. So you can take your business somewhere else. Did you get all those questions down? Do you have more questions? Do you feel like, man, this financial stuff, this is a lot. I could use some help. Well, <laughs> Luckily for you, I am launching a financial confidence boot camp. Um, registration opens on Wednesday, September 1st. Um, it is a four week program that covers money basics that will empower you to take control over your financial life. So you struggling with budgeting, you struggling with investing, you don't understand all of these terms you're, you're trying to figure out how can you achieve financial independence these are the things we will talk about in the boot camp it is just like you know an exercise boot camp it's intense it's short but you will be in so, such better shape <laughs> by the end of the boot camp uh i i, I really believe this is going to be life-changing for some people so there is a link to uh sign up 
to get information and register in the description. Thank y'all for watching. If you haven't subscribed, do that. Share this video. If you know someone who needs some help with their money, share this video with them. And until next time, I'll see y'all.